Today we're going to cover a really cool subject that not a lot of channels talk about. So let's get stuck in with rotary. Now CNC rotaries are one of those devices that you can really do some cool projects with, but there are some limitations that you need to know about. And that's what we're going to cover in this episode, along with things such as bits, material, and the software you'll need to give consideration to. Now the big advantage to a rotary device is it will clamp your material and hold it in position, making it more secure, and it also revolves it from a central position. So you can actually use different shape material in your machine, such as square or rectangular stock. Let's actually take a closer look at some rotary devices. Now behind me, I have three different rotaries. We've got one from Makara, one from Saint Smart Genmitsu, and the Vortex from CNC Labs. Other companies do make them as well, such as Pawn CNC and also Onefinity. And I should mention the Onefinity rotary is an absolute beast. Now in terms of the rotaries themselves, you typically find that manufacturers will make them specifically for their machines. However, if you want to try and adapt one to your machine, they're usually not that difficult because they all have the same four wire setup. So it's really just about the changing the connector over for the machine that you actually have. Now in terms of the rotaries themselves, these are all built in a very similar way with very similar components. On one side you will basically have your stepper motor that drives the machine itself. You will then have the uh, chuck. This is what holds your material in place and ultimately grips it to give it that security. Now in terms of the chuck itself, if you're familiar with like a wood turning lathe, exactly the same principle. This has four little devices in it, sometimes three, which are called the jaws, and these ultimately help grip the material. But the thing about these is they can be taken out and reversed around. So instead of just gripping the material, they can actually open out from the inside to clamp something like a tube from the inner edge. So there's one big advantage to them. As I say, the other advantage as well is because it holds it in this central position, you can use different material, as I've already mentioned, such as square and rectangular stock. Obviously, cylindrical is very easy, and it is just something to factor in when you are looking at these. A common misconception is is that the widest piece of material you can fit is defined by the width between the two jaws. There are ways around this to place bigger pieces of material in. For example, you can attach a smaller piece of wood to the end of your material that will sit inside there. There are also devices that you can make or 3D print to do exactly this same job. Now again, most of them will sit on some sort of plate. This is ultimately to keep the parts aligned. And on the opposite end of that plate, you'll have this device right here which is called the tailstock. Now this is ultimately helping to secure your material into that jaw. When your material is in place and you're bringing in your tailstock, obviously you'll want the point to touch up with the center point on your material. You just slide this into place. Once it's there, lock it in position and then you will have an adjuster here basically to add a little bit more pressure and just guarantee that it's clamped down and then you can lock that off. This is universal across most tailstocks. Now the key thing when securing your piece of material in the device is making sure it is as central as possible. Now obviously the jaws should clamp in centrally and make this easier, but if you are using rectangular stock, you'll need to account for this. And on the opposite end, you just need to mark the center of your material using something like a center finder, or if it's square stock, drawing diagonally from corner to corner, and that gives you the point that that interacts with it. Now when it comes to the material itself, this is probably one of the areas that is its biggest limitation, but also that you have to give consideration to. Now obviously because this is fixed in position from a central point, you have to understand the amount of depth above or below that you can operate in. Let's say for example, from this center point of the tailstock down to the base plate, it is three inches. You'd probably go, oh, I can use something up to six inches in diameter on that. Well. Theoretically, yes, but on most desktop CNC machines, actually, the height that the spindle sits at is what's going to limit it. To highlight the point, you can see the top of the material there. I can just about get my finger underneath that gap, which allows enough for a Z safety height. Whereas the bottom of the material, there is a lot more space. So actually, it's not the limitation down to the bottom, it's the limitation from the middle up to the bit itself. The width is also the other element. Now, depending on how far over your spindle actually has 
hands from your axis may limit the material that you can use or other factors such as brackets that may be in place. Now I'm quickly going to interrupt my own video. Those of you who follow me know I'm in the middle of developing my very own Speeds and Feeds app specifically for smaller desktop CNC machines, which is an area a lot of people struggle with. So if you haven't done so already, head over to OnlyCNCs.com and sign up to get all of the latest updates for when that is going to be released. Back to your regular viewing. And one last thing to mention on the width or diameter of your material, when you are working with square or rectangular stock, it is not the actual width of it, you need to measure diagonally. That is ultimately what is defining the highest point because there you may think it fits okay, but then you could rotate it round 45 degrees and ultimately that is then going to be much higher than it was a second ago. So those are the types of things you need to consider. Now in regards to the obviously width and the depth, we've covered that, but what about the length of the material? Now this is where it often varies between manufacturers. For example, the Vortex that I have here, this tail stock can be easily adjusted to allow it longer pieces. It also has an extension track, so you can basically cover the full width of the machine itself and get in larger pieces maybe something like a baseball bat. Now obviously smaller devices like the Science Smart one, you're often limited to how big of the material you can get in there. And a lot of that space is taken up by the step motor and the chuck itself. So something like these two behind me, you're talking about much smaller lengths, maybe six inches, maybe up to eight inches at most on something like the Maycara one. As we've just been talking about material, let's stick on that subject for now. What materials can you actually machine in a rotary device? Well, the honest answer is any materials your machine is capable of handling. So I've obviously machined wood in rotary devices, but I've even gone up to machining aluminium in them. As long as your machine is strong enough, rigid enough and capable to machine it, then it will work in the rotary as the same way as it would actually holding it down on your CNC bed. So you really do have a large versatility of materials that you can use in this, everything from soft materials through to hard materials like metal, maybe even acrylic, plastic pipe, those type of things to say. If your machine can typically machine it, then the rotary will do it as well. The only consideration you have to give at this point is controlling the speeds that it will machine at. Now, as I just mentioned speed, that actually reminds me of something I did want to cover in this video. Often when you're watching videos of rotaries at normal speed, they will feel quite slow. And it's something that people do not realize before purchasing one. If your CNC machine is capable of running a A axis or a fourth axis, you will probably find that by default, it is set to go at a much slower speed than the actual CNC machine itself. Now the reason for this is ultimately, even though this does hold your material secure, it's probably not as secure as like when you're clamping things down flat with clamps in every corner or tape and glue. Now don't get me wrong, the default settings can always be overridden and you probably can still take things up to be much faster. But if you get a rotor and it feels really slow, that is why your CNC machine is likely slowing it down because of that reason. Let's move on to talk about bits. So what bits can you use on your rotary device? Well, in the same way that it applied to material, pretty much any other bit that you are used to using. So your standard end mills, your up cuts, your down cuts, your V bits, your tapered ball noses, all of those can be used on the rotary device to get some amazing results. Any standard type of bit that you would expect to use on your CNC machine, you can still use with the rotary as well, as say ultimately to get the type of finish or detail that you're expecting, defined by those bits as they naturally would be. Now, some of you may want to use chunkier pieces of stock, but actually go down to quite narrow sections, particularly where you may be adding tabs. Do remember the depth of your bit is going to play a crucial part. In this scenario, I couldn't really machine it much deeper than an inch and a half into the material itself with this particular end mill. Using something like an extended end mill or maybe a tapered ball nose bit, which are often longer, may be a better option. Now in a very similar way to actually purchasing a CNC machine, other than the physical device itself, the next biggest consideration 
is software. And the reality is your software options are limited for a rotary device. Now, the only free option out there really is Fusion 360, and this is limited to personal use. Now, the downside to Fusion 360 is whilst it is very powerful, it's actually probably one of the more complex pieces of software to actually learn. If you come from that type of background, you may pick it up pretty easy. But if you're new to CNC and new to this way of designing and that software, it's probably going to be quite a challenge for you. Now, moving onto that into paid for software we do have a couple of obvious choices that are quite common in the market so you have carveco maker and maker plus and vectric vcarve and vcarve pro now these both do have an element of fourth axis design in them but it is what is known as a flat wrap design now what this basically means is you're basically designing it on a flat surface like you would a piece of paper or a normal 2d design and then at the end of it it takes that design and wraps wraps it into the cylinder that you need to machine. Now there are two downsides to this. One, you can't actually do things like 3D models in there. So for example, if you wanted to machine a chess piece, it can't handle that. The other thing as well is it doesn't really handle square or rectangular stock. So it can only focus on cylindrical objects and therefore if you're machining something that has square edges, it doesn't know that it needs to take those off as part of the machining job. Now, if you want to see an example of how this actually works in reality, there is a link in the corner to my Carveco Maker tutorial for fourth axis that will talk you through its capabilities. But beyond that, well, both Carveco and Vectrix top piece of software do have full fourth axis capabilities, but they are pretty pricey. So probably not what most people are looking for. So if the only free piece of software is too complex to use and the two most popular brands out there either have limited function or at their high point are too expensive to purchase, then what does that leave? Well, it leaves a piece of software called Desk Proto. Now I've been using this for a couple of years for all my fourth axis 3D model work. And I can honestly say it is a nice piece of software to use. And the price point isn't bad, especially for personal use. So I'll put the actual details on screen and obviously links down below. There is a commercial option as well, which will obviously be more expensive. But the key thing here is you're looking at their multi axis license. This allows you to do all of the rotary fourth axis work. And actually using the software is very easy as well. You can obviously go in and do things manually, but they also have wizards to walk you through. So for example, you would just select the machine that you have, load in a 3D model, work out the axis and orientation that you want it, and then basically select the bits you want to use and it does all of the calculations for you. And I would probably say that if rotary work is the main thing you're aiming for, then this is definitely the best bang for your book. Obviously, there's no reason you can't run it alongside other software like Carveco and Vectric, but I'd say for specifically for rotary work, that is definitely the best value out there at the minute. So let's move on to the other half of the software, which is the control element. Unfortunately, this is much easier and cheaper to go through. Now, there are a few pieces of free software out there that will operate and control your fourth axis rotary, such as G-Sender that I've got behind me, UGS, and also Open Builds. Some of your more simpler pieces of software, though, such as Candle and Easel, do not operate or run a fourth axis. So that's just one thing to bear in mind. The other thing I'll reference is something like the Saint Smart Machine. You can't actually run the fourth axis through a computer. You need its offline controller to run the rotary device for this. Any of the others, as I say, they will run from typical software such as OpenBuilds, GSender, and UGS. So what type of projects can you do on your rotary devices? Well, it's usually limited by your imagination. Typically, I'm doing smaller things like ornamental pieces or these little 3D models. And the amount of detail that you can get out of these is amazing, especially if you use something like a tapered ball nose bit or a V bit. But as long as your machine is big enough, well, you can do much larger projects as well. For example, things like Harry Potter ones, you may do walking sticks, you may do baseball bats. So really, as I say, it's whatever you can come up with that fits within the rotary and on your machine, well, you can machine it just like you would anything else. So your creativity is key here to really making a success from your rotary device. But in terms of making a profit from your rotary device, well, it really depends on the market that you're operating in, 
versus your creativity and ideas that you can come up with the things to produce on them at a profit. And it'll say, if you can find that niche area of things to make and ultimately make a profit from them, then it's going to be a brilliant opportunity because whilst a lot of people have CNC machines, only a small proportion actually have rotary devices. So if you are looking for a more niche area to expand into, this is definitely one to take a look at. Now earlier I touched on using your Y axis for your fourth axis. Now whilst this does vary slightly between different machines, this control box is a typical example of what you may see where your outputs are limited to just an X, a Y and a Z. There is no I axis or fourth axis. So what you would do in this scenario is position your head so it is directly above the center of your rotary device, obviously moving the Y axis to get it in position. Once it is there, you would disconnect your Y axis and use that connection to connect it to your rotary device. That way the Y axis stays where it is, but now when you jog what would traditionally be the Y axis, it should rotate your rotary device. Now there are a couple of things to note here. Obviously, if your machine has a dual Y axis with two motors, make sure you disconnect both motors. The other thing is about your steps, the amount of movement every time you try to click a button. The rotary is likely going to be different than your standard steps for your Y axis. The difference with a rotary is we are controlling it so it knows what one full rotation is, as opposed to something like a Y axis where you may jog it 100 mil and want it to move 100 mil. So to recap, rotary devices are really cool and you can make some amazing projects with them. And there are definitely some niche markets out there that you can make good profit from. But your consideration needs to go beyond just the device itself into things such as the software as well as the size of the material each one can actually handle on your particular machine. Now, if you do have any questions, comment down below and I'll obviously do my best to answer them. All links to the different rotaries I've mentioned I will also put in the description area below. So definitely go and check those out. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you haven't done so already, give it a thumbs up and make sure you do subscribe. Thank you all very much for watching and final thanks as always goes to my patrons. I will see you all on the next episode.